of his world history. But Allen was a true Renaissance man. And in addition to his distinguished career as a professor of library science, he was also a distinguished farrier, or a chewer of horses. Um, and those of us who took reference with him also know horses as named quadrupeds. Um, I don't know how many of you <laughs> understand the reference, but that was basically um, Johnson's dictionary de definition of the horse. Um, so Alan was also an ex expert on Robert's rules of order, which apparently he started reading as a child. Um, <laughs> I don't know what it was like at the dinner table. I'm pretty sure it was interesting. Um, and he also wrote what is likely the definitive work on the oscillation dulcimer. Uh, those of us who are lucky enough to have studied with Alan or spent any time at all with him know that he had a real uh, way with words. Uh, actually, to the extent to which that some of his former students created a wiki documenting some of his more famous um, and better known sayings. So I thought I'd just read a couple of them to you right now because they will give you a much better sense of Alan than I could ever do. Um, a couple of my favorites. One was his advice, and this is especially for you students when people ask you what you're going to school for, to tell them I'm studying to take bibliographic control. <laughs> towards the, the start of electronic resources. You know, he was coming to the end of his career as we were starting to go online. Um, and with regard to searching online, he said, online databases are just casseroles. You're not quite sure what's in it. If it's a church casserole, you know you're pretty safe. If not, you'd best not go there. <laughs> um, he also had advice on running meetings. I mentioned that he was an expert on Robert's rules of order. So his rule one for meetings, no meetings over 20 minutes and no one can so Eileen, I just thought I'd give that away <laughs> for the next faculty meeting. Um, one more, he said, I see nothing. So again, those of us who have had him for class know that he was very strict about the use of exclamation points. He said you get a quota, and when you're done, you're done. Uh, and so the, and I never knew what the exact uh, quote was, but this is it. I see nothing in the literature of librarianship that would demand the use of exclamation points. If you were born before 1960, you have three exclamation points. If you were born after 1960, you get six, and some of you are in debt. <laughs> and I'll just finish up with my favorite one, I think, was in regard to reference, since that is also one of my areas. He said, the answer is inconsequential, it's how we go about finding the answer. I think that's a nice way of framing just kind of who Alan was. Um, but it's also my pleasure tonight, then, to introduce our Alan Smith Visiting Scholar. And this year, it is Paul Sturgis who is Professor Emeritus from Loughborough University, and also Professor Extraordinary from the University of Pretoria. We definitely would like to know how you go about getting that. <laughs> um, Paul has traveled widely throughout the world. He gives lectures and conference presentations um, and leads workshops in particular on intellectual freedom topics. Um, he was consultant to the Council of Europe on Freedom of Ex Expression and chair to the International Federation of Library Association Freedom of Access About 20 years ago, I was walking through the streets of Addis Ababa with Blaise Cronin. Blaise, you may know as uh, Dean at Bloomington and editor of Jacist. And Blaise said to me as he looked around this dusty street and uh, with a certain distaste, a kind of aristocratic distaste, though he's not one actually aristocrat. Um, Paul, why do you come to these places? What's it for? I said, uh, not sure, Blaze. Why do you come? Oh, so much to tell them. They need to know the sort of things that I know about, and it's a kind of mission to come and inform them and help them develop and improve. Hmm. Thought about it a bit more. You know, Blaze, I think the reason I come is because it's so exotic. 
And that was kind of a clever, clever way of saying that it was the sheer difference, the sheer freshness that I experienced when traveling that appealed to me. The ability to learn. Uh, I didn't place the emphasis on what I could tell them. I placed the emphasis on what I could learn from them. And that's the theme of this lecture tonight. I had a change, a big change, uh, around about 1984. I'd had a very conventional career up until then, quite enjoyed it, but uh, felt sort of unfulfilled. And I got the offer of this temporary contract at the University of Botswana to teach library and information science there. And virtually the first thing that I realized was that pretty well everything I knew, pretty well everything I taught, all my uh, preconceptions were irrelevant, that I had to try extremely hard to learn my way into a new environment so that I could teach different content in a different kind of a way. It was a big assignment, but I was still young enough to um, be prepared to take it on. I'd come from an environment where there were lots of libraries, where there were um, committed users, and where the practices of libraries were well established and uh, highly developed. What did I come to? I came to a place where there were very few libraries. Botswana was a country with quite a nice pattern, of rather well-built and well-stocked libraries. There still weren't many, and it was still quite unusual in Africa. Very few experienced librarians. That's what the school um, in Botswana was about. It was about building up a cadre of librarians where one hadn't existed before. But it was a question of cultures, really, that uh, was most important. People just didn't look towards libraries. They didn't look towards formal sources of information. They um, had a whole different way of finding out, a whole different way of organizing their lives, and an insight into this was something that I knew that I needed. I needed different research questions. And there was virtually no library science research in Africa in those days. There was a smattering of publications, uh, a lot from South Africa. But they were very uh, conventional in, in the tradition of European and North American librarianship. Papers which engaged with Africa as it was, you could count on the fingers of one hand. One paper that I enjoyed a great deal was um, from Nigeria, and one called uh, Professor Abayadi. Every Friday, he took a small research team out to uh, a particular village. They sat down in the shade of a tree at the end of the village and waited for people to come. People came, were encouraged to ask questions. On the next Friday, they brought back answers to the questions. But this little bit of uh, exploratory research, they monitored and wrote up, and said something really very interesting about what people seemed to want to know about. And whilst, as an outsider, you assume that they were desperate to have good health information, good practical information about work, uh, information about schooling, and this would be the totality of what they were interested in, they did want these things, but it wasn't the totality. They wanted entertainment. They wanted football scores from the city. Um, they wanted stuff to do with their religion. They wanted devotional works. Their information needs were not predicted terribly well in the sort of literature that was available. Uh, but that paper was incredibly rare. It was about the only thing you could read that gave you a bit of an insight. So questions like, what did people really want to know? Uh, how they sought it? whether they could find it or not, who they trusted, who they trusted. This was absolutely central. Who do you trust when you're um, trying to get information? Is it somebody official? Is it a librarian? Or is it somebody in the community? By and large, it's somebody in the community. And what was the potential for new kinds of services? And that last question was something that stayed open, really, for decades. I 
think we have an answer emerging these days, and that is the use of the uh, cell phone. Immensely significant in Africa and the rest of the developing world. And it's transforming so much, and it's transforming ways that we, even as cell phone uh, users, didn't predict and couldn't predict. Out of Africa, something new. But the openness that I tried to cultivate to questions like this actually revealed a great deal to me that I hadn't expected. The unexpected encounters referred to in the title of this presentation. Murder, sex, and magic. Well, that was just me being clever, clever. Uh, <laughs> sat down at this table at the uh, Milan uh, IFLA, and there were a number of extremely nice people there and didn't know each other terribly well. And somebody said, let's introduce ourselves. Um, people said things like, I'm uh, the director of the library services in such and such a city, and I'm this and I'm that. And I just said, uh, I'm a researcher, and my topics are, and the words just came out. I hadn't really thought about them. Uh, and um, I thought for a while that they weren't terribly well chosen, but they amused people, and we had uh, nice discussions about it. But I think, in fact, they were quite well chosen. Murder, sex, and marriage, magic do tell us something. Uh, they are uh, valid topics. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about the significance of violence or violent death and destruction in the developing world. I'll talk a bit about the consequences of sexuality and I'll take it just a little bit underneath with perceptions of the irrational, the magical. Uh, which one gets if one is open, if one is sufficiently open to things that are swirling around underneath and which you could easily not spot if you weren't tuned into. Murder. Well, I don't really mean murder. I mean violent death. And it's there. It's there all the time. You can't close your eyes to it. Traffic accidents, for instance, are one of the biggest killers in most African countries and developing countries elsewhere. The roads are dreadful, uh, traffic behavior is dreadful, the vehicles are dreadful, uh, the surfaces are dreadful, and people suffer. People also have a very casual attitude towards uh, people on foot behavior in traffic, and there's a toll, a constant toll. But interestingly, it's something which can be addressed by information. Road safety campaigns are a possibility, and where they're tried, they begin to have some sort of effect. So information and accidents have a connection. But um, personal violence. Some of the traditions in Africa don't totally outlaw personal violence. Maasai tribesmen in Kenya and Tanzania feel that it's perfectly normal that if a quarrel escalates to a certain point, men will fight and somebody will get hurt. And when hauled before the courts for uh, an assault or murder, they will be unable to comprehend what a stupid thing is taking place. Men need to uh, take this kind of action because that's what men do. But armed conflict was the focus that I took um, in some detail, which I researched in some detail. For reasons too complicated to explain, I began to explore the possibility that in armed conflict, particularly the informal small wars, liberation wars, uh, banditry, the role of information, if it was put at the center, would, re uh, would reveal a great deal about these conflicts, which regarding them as military conflicts only, did not. So a shift of paradigm from regarding these conflicts as violence to regarding these conflicts as information contests. And I developed an approach which looked at the way information was acquired in conflicts, 
the way in which information will suppress and the way in which information is disseminated, a threefold approach. And my implication was that those who controlled information in these areas would actually win the conflicts and those who did not would be hard put to, to win. A term once used in Malaysia by a British general was winning hearts and minds, and I think that's been used since uh, in Vietnam, probably, and so on. Hearts and minds are at the center of it, but information is the route into hearts and minds. I developed a model. It, it just hit me one day. I was sitting in my room, and I needed a, a biggish piece of paper on which to sketch it out, and I found an old envelope, and I literally drew my model on the back of an envelope, which um, wasn't intentional, but I was rather pleased with afterwards. It expresses the field of information conflict as a disk or circle. The surface, uh, like the surface of a millstone, which is referred to as the land, that's term, millstone terminology, Alan Smith probably knew a bit about millstone terminology as well as shoeing horses. Um, and the grooves on the surface are known as the channels. So you have the land and you have the channels and you can express the elements of information as uh, segments of circle. The two opposing stones, which you have with millstone. The analogy doesn't entirely hold for reasons which I won't go into because millstone technology is a bit of a diversion from the thing. But um, one for each opposing side. They take the grain, that's information, grind out um, good products, the flour, the meal, or whatever you call it, and chaff, useless information, is separated out. As I say, the flaws in the analogy are quite obvious to experts, but uh, it works quite well as a way of expressing things. So here's the millstone. Um, you've got information acquired and disseminated out in the field, information at the command centers, and information through the media. Uh, you've got the concepts of input, output, and suppression, and each of those sections is divided into overt and covert. It's a way of, um, it's a matrix, essentially, for identifying information aspects, which you wouldn't necessarily think about unless you had the guidance of the matrix. It doesn't do anything more than organize your thoughts and organize your information, but I found it worthwhile, and one or two um, research students in universities here and there have actually adapted versions of the model. I wish it was many, but it's one or two, <laughs> and I've uh, come to hear about them. So my one entry into model making came uh, when I was working on these conflicts. And I worked the um, thing through in a couple of cases. One was the banditry of the Lord's Resistance Army in uh, northern Uganda, but the struggle in Namibia. Uh, and here the case was very clear cut because the military wing of SWAPO, the freedom movement, was described, and nobody really dissents from this except perhaps the former commanders, possibly the most inept freedom fighting army in the third world. Possibly. And yet, the Namibian struggle was brought to a successful conclusion. Why? Because SWAPO were masters of information. They were good at that and not the fighting. And their research and documentation was excellent. They had research and documentation uh, centers in um, Zambia and Tanzania, and they collected publications, they put out memos uh, and uh, news releases and so on, uh, very, very professionally. Intelligence and political education, their um, spies, if you want to call them that, were throughout the country. And their political education groups were um, talking to people in the villages, in the suburbs, and getting them um, politically alert in ways that were immensely effective. And their external propaganda and publicity was first class. 
they um, convinced the most influential countries in the world, uh, the governments of these countries, that supported SWAPO was politically uh, a good idea, that they were responsible and that independence would not disrupt the world pattern, uh, that they could handle it. And winning this propaganda war, and South Africa spectacularly lost it despite its attempts to um, flood the world with its propaganda. This was the decisive thing. They won the information war, they won the conflict, they became independent in 1990. And they've been a considerable success ever since. Namibia is one of those places, it's a pleasure to visit because you can see independence working. And I just crossed my fingers because I said the same thing about Zimbabwe. The Lord's Resistance Army in Uganda still exists. They banned its hold up somewhere in the Central African Republic or whatever. And they were very good in terms of field intelligence. The first time I ever became aware of them, I read a newspaper report which said, people in northern Uganda are extremely disturbed and scared because the scouts of the Lord's Resistance Army have been seen moving through the countryside. And it was frightening. The idea that these people were spying out the land and would be back soon. They set out as a, a resistance movement against the government, and, but when you look at them in information terms, they had no conventional propaganda capacity. They didn't even really try. A brief attempt at a few leaflets, uh, a short period when they had a radio station but their leader, Joseph Conney, tended to interrupt the programs with ranting speeches and ruin the whole effect. And a tendency to rely on spirit communication. Conney himself uh, claimed to be a medium, and a lot of what they did was said to be inspired by various named spirits who would turn up and guide them. Their communication was terrible. They would use mutilation of people as a message to others. So there'll be no spoken message, just a raid on a village, and people uh, attacked in the most grotesque and horrible kind of way that the message would be clear. They clearly were, even if in the first place they'd been a resistance move, movement, they clearly were, and still are, a bandit movement. I thought 10 years ago they had no prospect of long-term survival, but they're still out there somewhere uh, with their child soldiers. And, um, they're the child soldiers. And there's the sort of mess they're in. Death, destruction, all of it kind of pointless because the kind of the life that Connie and his uh, men are leading is not anything. And I think that the information paradigm, again, enables us to get a, a clearer hold on how futile they are, especially in comparison to something like Swap or Indonesia. Well, murder, lots of it. Sex. Sex um, for people who have very little else, few possessions, little money to spend, is a considerable joy and consolation. It's one of the few children, which also make life brighter. But there are downsides to health-related problems connected with sexuality in the kinds of conditions that we're talking about in modern African countries. Information is crucial to freeing sexuality to perform its positive role in human life as opposed to Children as a source of benefit um, to families, insurance for the future, creators of potential for family alliances. Very important. Large families. Sometimes people in the developing world are criticized by those of us who don't really understand for having large families. 
but the reasons for doing so are extremely good. Families um, enable people to actually have a better future in all sorts of practical ways. But maternity does have considerable perils attached to it. I remember very well spending some time with um, a health visitor out in a very isolated rural area of Kenya, describing the number of women who died from perfectly treatable uh, post-birth uh, difficulty bleeding and so on, which in a decent clinical or hospital could be sorted out, the women dying from. Uh, the business of spacing pregnancies so that uh, women regain their strength in between is very, very important and not something that is easy to um, persuade people to try and seek. And it also leads to children who develop poorly over the years. Child marriage leads to too early pregnancy and a whole host of and of course, uh, leave it to last because it's not the main emphasis as far as I'm concerned, but sexually transmitted diseases, HIV, AIDS, uh, very much over the last 30 years. Thrive where contraception, barrier contraception is not available. S all of these kinds of problems can be addressed through information campaigns and are addressed through information campaigns. Uh, child spacing. age of marriage, female genital mutilation, um, sexually transmitted diseases, all of these can be attacked with the use of information. But in the rural areas, facilities are really so thin on the ground. You're dependent uh, in the picture, uh, obviously a trained nurse, the traditional birth attendant whose practical knowledge of childbirth may be good, but whose ability to cope in extreme circumstances, extreme difficulties, is not all that um, positive. For families, they need information about contraception, uh, nutrition, sex-related uh, diseases and conditions. But the practitioners, the traditional birth attendants, and and the community information on the difficulties of uh, traditional sex-related practices and relationships, uh, practices. All of these need information and the clinics. You see a fairly rackety sort of clinic and uh, it's, it's extremely depressing when you do go into places which are not clean, places which don't have beds, And whilst information is important, the basics are uh, neglected too. So there's enormous scope for uh, improving uh, the whole range of things connected with um, sexuality in developing countries, but information is a major contributor. Which brings me to, in some ways, the area which I find uh, most fascinating. I don't think there's much magic in uh, North America and European life. Uh, not many surprising things going off that um, pull us up short and make us rethink. But Africa, uh, South America, uh, Asia, these things are there and they're very, very close to the surface. Oral tradition. Traditional healing, old religions and cults, all of these things we know exist, we know they're out there. And we know that these things remain, even though modern science 
modern technology and modern religion. In, fr in uh, French-speaking West Africa, I spoke to uh, somebody from Burkina Faso. I asked if conversation took place in French, interestingly, not, uh, and I was able to cope. Um, I asked him about religion in the country. He said, oh, well, about half of the people are Muslims, about half of the people are Christians. But in fact, in fact, most of the people are fetishur. Uh, in other words, animists, people whose chief religious devotion is to um, some object or creature. He said, mes parents, ils adorent les montagnes. My parents adore the mountains. What worship the mountains, but it sounded like his parents loved to go off skiing for the weekend. <laughs> um, understood what he meant the, the mountains nearby, which were a subject of religious devotion for his family. If you keep your ears and eyes open, you will see a great deal. You'll hear rumors, people will talk about. Don't have the language, things will be mentioned. You will see things which, if you ask questions, will lead you into areas which are quite different and um, involve practices quite unlike anything we're used to. An example will be the Miao cult in Malawi. Unexpected phenomena. Known as particularly dangerous creatures, feared throughout the world, well, throughout most of the world, throughout most of the world. And even the media, even the media can tell you all sorts of interesting things. And I'll deal in particular with uh, an example. So I'll try and talk about rumors, things you see, phenomena you may engage with a little more closely, and things which are actually in your bulletin. There's a pretty typical Mooty story. Uh, pretty good stock of varied Mooty. Medicine, traditional medicine. Bits and bobs of animals, herbs, uh, talismans, and Is Muti made? And there are always rumors that particularly strong and effective Muti can be made from the body parts of young people who are sacrificed for the purpose. You will hear of um, an unexpected and rather inexplicable accident, usually involving some young person who's particularly uh, talented. Positive, and something takes them away. And the rumor is that they were identified as a possible source of some very useful mooty which would bring strength to the people who use it and so on. So it's not just the things you see on the stall, it's other stuff. Things stuff sold under the counter of the stall. Is it true? I don't know. But you hear it from many different angles. And people do believe in the powers of these traditional medicines. I said I would use the uh, Miao cult as my example of things you see. What I saw wasn't exactly like uh, in that photo. I was driving through a rural area in Malawi with my local counterpart, and we saw way ahead on the dirt road some dust being not enough dust for a vehicle, maybe enough for a bicycle, but probably somebody on foot. And as we got closer, we could see that it was a man running at a steady jog, steady, regular jog. And he was naked except for a pair of bright red underpants. I don't think these guys have got red underpants, but they're very much like he was. And as we drew level with him, he didn't turn back, he didn't turn and look at us, his posture stayed the same, but he just pulled off the road and began to run along the side. And as we passed him, I could see that his face was whitened and he had a kind of headdress of twigs or uh, something like that. And he looked straight.
straight ahead, and as far as he was concerned, we didn't really exist. So I said to my companion, who is he and what's he doing? So he said, uh, oh, he's a member of the Niao Corps. And I said, uh, so what are they for? Oh, well, they have get-togethers. Um, they have a bonfire, and they uh, brew some beer, and uh, they probably dance and so on. And uh, I said, well, why? He said, oh, uh, they do some fundraising. They raise funds for charitable causes. It actually was made to sound rather like a sort of version of Rotary um, <laughs> in red underpants and uh, headdress. Um, and I think in some cases it is. Uh, to some extent, the cults are a little bit domesticated. But there again, they're about magic, they're about uh, finding ways to exercise power and influence. And I feel privileged that I actually saw on a road in Malawi somebody going to one of their meetings. It's really not unlike the men in the picture there. In Burkina Faso, um, I was asked if, on an afternoon when we weren't working, if I'd like to go to uh, a very interesting uh, tourist attraction about 100 kilometers out of town. So I said, fine. Didn't even ask what it was. And we drove up the roads and reached a village. And there was a sign there, sure enough, named the village and said, uh, registered tourist attraction with the Ministry of, of Tourism of Burkina Faso. And uh, they said, it'll cost us uh, a couple of dollars each, but that includes chicken. Can afford to put on a meal for a couple of dollars each. No, they didn't mean for us. They meant that the chicken live would be on the end of a rope and would be dangled in front of a crocodile which was down on the edge of the pool. And then we would be encouraged, while the crocodile was concentrating on the chicken, to go and pet it. <laughs> and there you see me uh, not looking as nervous as I felt. <laughs> Uh, squatting over the back of a crocodile which was actually a great deal bigger than the photo shows. It was vast, I can tell you. This is a registered tourist attraction. And maybe they have some way of hypnotizing or drugging the, the crocodile so that it won't uh, get distracted from the chicken and attack the tourists. Well, maybe. Well, maybe. Because after you've gone through this particular they take you on a walk around the lake to the far side, and on the far side there are many, many crocodiles basking, and you walk in amongst them with them only a meter or two from your ankles. And while you're doing it, the young man from the village explains to you about the relationship of the village with the crocodiles. Uh, illustrates it with various points, pulls up some crocodile dung and shows the content to her and illustrates their diet answers the question, do they ever take um, children from the village? No, 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 they wouldn't do that. No, no. Occasional pig, but never the children. <laughs> and he explains the background to it. Um, by the way, the better photo of a local person with a crocodile, you can see there the sort of relationship. Some generations ago, um, the people who now are the villagers uh, needed a new place to live, and they were wandering through the savannah not able to find anywhere, and also not able to find any water. And they found themselves so weakened that the only possibility was that the young chief would go ahead and try and find some water so that they could go to it and revive themselves and continue their journey. So the chief went ahead, and after a while, he succumbed to uh, dehydration and collapsed. But after a while, he found himself being dragged along. Well, he could resist, and he didn't know anything about who was dragging him or whatever, but he just hoped it would be somewhere uh, that would be okay. And he was dragged to a lake, and he was able to drink the water and revive himself. And then he looked and saw that he'd been dragged by a crocodile. And he and the crocodile came to an arrangement that ever after, the crocodiles in that lake and the people of his group, uh, the villagers now, would live together in harmony. And they do. They live together in harmony. Now they have the registered tourist attraction, um, but I can tell you it doesn't amount to anything other than having a supply of live chickens and a rope hanging. <laughs> what are we seeing there? We're actually seeing something very difficult. Does it different from anything you would expect? It 
conflicts with our knowledge of the crocodile as an animal. It's got this spiritual dimension. The story which backs it up is more than just um, a foolish legend. But Uganda. The primary school was closed um, in 2004 because the pupils suffered from demon possession. I think I have a photo. Yeah, classic uh, school under demon possession. The kids are writhing around, um, screaming, falling over, uh, running away. And this can go on for days. It's something that uh, has been seen in different manifestations throughout the world, uh, medieval dancing uh, outbreaks. Uh, are an example, for instance, in Europe. But demon possession in the school is something that um, does still happen. And in this particular village, uh, a local man, Serankuma, was arrested and he admitted acquiring demons. Uh, he'd acquired them from a witch doctor and he wanted them because the demons could make him rich and uh, successful. He hoped. But unfortunately, the demons proved uh, more of a problem because he couldn't meet their demands. They actually demanded uh, 300 virgins and a supply of cattle whose blood they could drink. And um, Kuma just couldn't assemble the necessary virgins and cattle, so he turned them loose. But, and he was very apologetic. He didn't um, try and brazen it out. He said, look, my offense is failing to control demons. Now, what law covers that, I don't know, but that's what his defense was. The story in the New Vision newspaper was one of the most fascinating things that I've ever read. It contained little <laughs> statements from all sorts of significant people uh, related to the event and in the community. And I can't remember them, so I'll read a few out, and I'll need a bit more light to be able to read them, I think, because let me try with my reading glasses. The parents, of course, were terribly upset by the whole thing, and... No, I can read the actually. They were tired of what the demons had done, and they wanted, some of them wanted to move away. This is an expected reaction, but it's the rest of the reactions which are fascinating. The district commissioner said, I wonder why people really acquire demons and resort to bewitching others. She just couldn't seem to understand it. And she cautioned the public against acquiring demons. They called in a traditional healer, a man called Ben Gulu. And he was, in fact, a very significant healer because he was chairman of the National Association of Healers. And he was asked to ritually cleanse the school. Uh, and he did, in fact, cure 15 of the particularly badly affected students by holding herbs over their heads and uh, wielding a cow's horn wound with bark cloth. And he pointed out that harmless demons don't look for blood and human sacrifices, which I think is quite an important point to make. Gull was also the uh, sub-county chairman, and in that role he commented again. Um, he called for a review of the laws on witchcraft because they were demonstrably too weak. The district police commissioner commented, um, and he was rather distressed by incidents of mob justice uh, which tended to occur on these occasions and were usually due to um, witchcraft accusations. A Catholic priest was called in and he prayed over the pupils, but it's not recorded as doing much good. Um, and he doesn't seem to have made any memorable content, but he was there and he was doing his best. A local councillor agreed that it was unacceptable to acquire demons and suggested we have to come up with a bylaw to evict anyone will be found with demons. Again, a practical suggestion. And the local health services director uh, didn't say much, except that cases were still being examined in the local laboratory. 
So you've got a whole range of statements from people, none of which express any skepticism towards the fact that this had been a case of demon possession. That nobody tried to explain it in a different kind of way. Nobody, um, including the journalists. The whole story was written without critical comment, just in the words and describing the actions of the various players involved. And that, to me, was the most significant thing. And the question it left me with, which stayed with me for a while, what does this suggest about the possibilities for modern information services, libraries, and so on, which we provide, in a community where beliefs of this kind are so deeply embedded, where mentalities are so demonstrably different? And this is what's important about it, as far as I'm concerned, that we are in an environment where people believe different things, act in different ways, and these are not shallow, surface kinds of um, preoccupation. So, what do I mean by my concern with murder, sex, and magic? Is it just an excuse to tell travelers' tales? Well, it is a little bit of an excuse. <laughs> We've got to be honest about it. But I think library science is so overwhelmingly rational that somehow or other we have to try and let in uh, a little bit of the less rational, not only in developing countries, but here too. We believe that if we provide the high quality libraries, the information systems, people will be easy to persuade to use them. Not always true. If we look at librarianship, the history of librarianship, a lot of it is a history of librarians trying to persuade people to use systems which, as far as the librarians are concerned, are self-evidently appropriate, and as far as the users are concerned, are not so obviously uh, useful for their needs. And as far as I'm concerned, that if we look at places where rationality is less obvious, there's more of an obligation to think about ways we can serve people's actual ways of thinking, rather than the notional ways of thinking which we tend to attribute to them. Maybe there are very different ways of looking at library and information science which admit the irrational a certain extent, which could really focus all of our professional attentions. But anyway, thanks for your attention. <laughs> I'm happy to um, answer questions, try to meet challenges. Um, I think we have a little time available for that. Yes? The if I remember correctly, back in the beginning, you were over there around 80, starting around 83. Or yes, 85, uh, 84 to 5. So this was around also when everyday life information seeking became a more commonly published topic. Yes. So there must, that must play into this to some degree. Yes, it does. Um, I was picking up vibrations of that from the literature that I read. Mm -hmm. And so my attention was naturally turned towards everyday life information seeking in this very different environment. But I will allege that the literature has really scarcely entered these uh, areas at all. It's still overwhelmingly about um, business people, school teachers, health workers in countries like this in Northern Europe. There's scarcely any literature, any substantial literature, uh, which goes into uh, rural areas or even um, the more developed parts of Asia, Africa, Latin America. Mostly the stuff I see in editing 
the journal that I edit is um, very directed to the information you need to feed yourself. So yep. far, everyday life information needs of farmers in an African country or yes. fishermen in an African country, but not the kinds of things that you've been talking about. So That's absolutely right. There is a certain literature of um, related to agriculture. Uh, the ways in which you can get price information to farmers so that they can market their goods better. The way that they can get information about agricultural inputs and so on. Yes, that has sprung up and there have been some very good studies of that. Not all in a library and information science context. Yeah. The economics literature has a certain amount. The anthropological literature has a certain amount. But it does exist now. And the time I was talking about um, was prehistory as far as a lot of this was concerned. And I had no grasp of the extent to which the mobile phone and the cell phone would transform things. And that's one of the most exciting stories in uh, information science in, in recent years. Not much written up yet. Uh, you have to rely on little stories in the uh, on appropriate websites and so on. Uh, journalists pick up this, there are some reports, but not many um, articles which explore the um, cell phone is now ubiquitous. I heard um, a Tanzanian colleague claim that now in Tanzania there are more cell phones than people. I find that hard to believe, but I don't find it hard to believe that there is an enormous penetration of the cell phone. But it's the development of specific apps for um, the needs of developing countries, which is the most exciting. So there is a lot of change. Authority is still um, located in traditional places. Chiefs, traditional healers, religious leaders, community leaders, these are the people who are trusted. And I said earlier, this question of trust is very, very important. This is where you um, need to connect if you want to provide service into the communities. Because people still talk as their main line of communication, and they talk and listen to and respect leaders whose position predates um, colonialism, and certainly predates uh, modern information sources. And you, uh, if you ignore that at your peril, undermine any service you provide if you don't recognize the significance. It's breaking down. Not as significant as it was, but it's still central. Um, so, just kind of piggybacking off of that, is the like oral tradition becoming something that archives and libraries in African nations are like looking into? Because I know that I actually I was just reading about this for my archives class, mm -hmm. like oral traditions in the United States and the UK, and um, how it kind of petered off that for a little bit because it's so important in a lot of these communities. Mm -hmm. Is that something that libraries are really looking into? There's a recognition. You will find some literature um, which says it's going to, it is important to archive. Very little archiving taking place. In Botswana, back in those days, 84-5, Radio Botswana had done a fantastic job in field recording um, traditional music. Mm -hmm. And they had a program once a week which was wonderful because the field recordings were raw and fresh and straight out of the archives, and probably only collected in the year or two before. Um, but it's, it's, it's pretty rare. And I actually think that some of what's written in the Library of Information and Science literature is unhelpful. It talks about preserving. It talks about fixing. And to me, tradition is a, a living thing, a mutating thing, something that if you try and pin it down, through recording in some form or other, you actually diminish or even damage. It's the way in which people relate to oral tradition and the way oral tradition changes and adapts that's important. And I don't think we've easily come to terms with, with that um, in relation to 
places where oral tradition is still immensely strong. In this part of the world, um, in Europe, you're going into rural communities and you're trying to catch what always seems seemed to settle sharp and, uh, and so on uh, in 1900, that they were catching the last of what um, was available in um, oral tradition. And it always seems that way. But in uh, Africa, Asia, Latin America, it's fresh, it's current, and it's not, it's not like a book, where if you preserve a book, you've got it in um, pretty well only, the only form it exists. Oral tradition isn't like that. I'm not explaining that terribly well, but um, it's a very strong conviction of mine that we need a, a better understanding of oral tradition if we're going to do something for it which is actually positive. That's interesting breaking points, yeah. Um, I think there's a good deal of genuinely useful knowledge in these traditions. You, I think, have observed some things which make sense, which are helpful. There are also things which are patent mistake. They really are, and they survive, and they do harm. Uh, beliefs and practices which are disastrous. Uh, not so much necessarily, perhaps, in the projects of an American city, but um, this makes it terribly difficult. You can't, yeah, as a scientist, you take it all, as far as you can, at its face value, as uh, a committed, uh, a socially committed uh, professional, you make these distinctions, and finding your way through that in a helpful way is not at all straightforward. Just preserving, that's um, a sort of archivist's exercise. Uh, taking something from it, building on things, building on things, where you can take um, traditional attitudes, practices, um, wise women, and so on, and use them as a strength. That's much more difficult. That's something we don't do well, if at all. Yes, um, I think that if we're going to um, learn for ourselves from this documentation in these forms, but it's also kind of dangerous because there's a sort of ownership of a lot of um, herbalism and traditional practices in developing countries, and the big pharmaceutical companies are violating that in the most gross kind of a way. Um, they're patenting out of the tradition where the ownership um, is like traditional intellectual property. Uh, we need to do it, we need to do it for the benefit of all of us, but the way it's being done uh, quite often is, is clumsy and even violent. The things we have ignored, uh, breastfeeding is, a, is an amazing example. How many of us would think that it wasn't best 
be bizarre. And it took research showing that it brought uh, a certain immunity to the child while it's still breastfed, that it brought a kind of a natural contraception which involved um, a natural um, baby spacing process. All sorts of factors which when you investigate them, you can see that the, the traditional, the natural, is better than um, opening a tin and uh, adding hot water to the, the contents. But, yeah. Mm. So you mentioned, I don't know how recently you spent any amount of time in that part of the world, but you have talked about the impact, the only thing we're only beginning to understand about the impact of the cell phone. Yeah. And I'm kind of interested in the um, articulation between, I guess, spirituality and the cell phone. Oh, Humans nice one. and the cell phone. They so, seem to me to be so unlike each other. Yeah. Um, what connects them is orality, I think, in the first place. People originally um, acquire cell phones so that they can keep on talking. You look at what happens here. People say it's changing. It's not changing people, it's freeing people. It's freeing people to be what they want to be, which is talking all the time <laughs> to somebody or other. Um, and oral society, talking is natural. Uh, but when you can talk to your cousin in another village, doesn't it enhance the whole thing? So the immediate attraction is that it enhances um, traditional ways of communication. But what's modern about it is the way the um, SMS, the, the, the text capacity, has also been harnessed. There's an immense amount of ingenuity gone into making the whole thing as cheap as possible, so it's as widely available as possible, uh, sometimes by um, patently violating the um, contracts with the manufacturers and suppliers and a service supplier. But there's also been this tremendous um, fertility in trying to find ways of making it possible to do the things that people need to do. And money transfers is the key one. People's lives have been blighted by their inability to lay hands on small sums of money which are available to them somewhere or other. I'm not talking about banks. I'm talking about what are called networks of affection, family and friends which exists and when you've got immediate contact with people can be called into play. And this is intimately connected with the spirituality uh, and so on that I've been talking about. It's not the same thing, but it sits right against it. And what the phone in different ways does is free it up. And people's lives are being made easier in all sorts of ways by the cell phone. They know it, and they put themselves out to acquire the cell phone, and they use it in different ways. Um, the head of a family will acquire uh, cell phones for members of the family so that they're round and about, and if they need to contact, they can just phone through, let it ring three times, and then be called back. Their phones don't even have any uh, worthwhile credit on them. Uh, ways of working which are developed to fit circumstances. And I think when you start to look at the way people's responses are uh, not conditioned by something from outside, they're inspired by their way of behaving, their particular needs. You can't help but be impressed, and certainly the cell phone. Uh, I've not researched on this myself, but a student of mine researched on it, and uh, we uh, wrote a paper based on it results which show all sorts of fascinating things uh, about cell phone use in the Gambia uh, region. Actually, just to add what you said about that, you were amazed there could be as many cell phones as people. So on one of my trips to the Middle East, I don't know, like 10 years ago, mm -hmm. 8 years ago, people had multiple cell phones. And yes. then you can talk to a lot of people at once. Yep. You carry them all with you and different people call you and then you can sort of have conversations going with two or three yep. people. So I could see how the number could really Yeah, the people who've got many compensate for the people yeah. who haven't yet got them. Yeah. The numbers probably are about imbalanced between people and phones, yeah. Sure. 
and there's a reason for it. But it's not a frivolous reason. It's very far from a frivolous reason. Um, what occurred to me while Yes. Within our countries, we have all these uh, pockets of culture yep. that um, you know we don't do a very good job of recognizing. We, we pretend that we're assimilating mm. <laughs> instead of sort of recognizing that there are these different kinds of cultural um, communities, mm. um, and that we're not. I don't know that we particularly do a good job of addressing mm. like from the library. So I'm not. I'm not asking questions. Well, it's, it's a very uh, useful point, but I don't uh, let it stop at communities. Um, it's perfectly true that we understand the specific communities probably better by looking at the developing world than we might. But I think we understand human beings better by looking at um, the developing world. Uh, things that happen there and things that are thought and done there are actually arising from human needs and human behavior patterns which we've rather denied here and yet exist. Take, for instance, killing. Killing other human beings, to me, is actually natural. We call it evil, we call it unnatural, but if you look at society throughout, killing is natural. Now, mainly, we suppress that. But we suppress a lot of natural urges for very, very good reasons. And killing is probably the best one. Law suppresses it. Morality divide, uh, derived from all sorts of directions suppress it. But when we allow it to emerge in war, what we discover is that some people whose behavior in times of peace is totally ordinary, are revealed to be natural killers. They're the snipers. They're the frontline troops. And they're a minority. But a lot of minorities express things which are natural to the whole community. Minorities uh, don't have to be looked at as um, something odd or uh, wrong. We used to look at homosexuality in that kind of way. Homosexuality is one of the variants of human behavior which are natural. Is too. We don't find that very easy, but if we look at the developing world, we find examples where it's recognized. I was once involved in this discussion, and um, somebody standing nearby was an old established uh, Ethiopia hound, been there long, involved in dip diplomacy, and he opened his mouth and said, all of these people uh, who say that Killing is utterly unnatural and it's evil and so on. They just forget about the Afars. And the Afars are a people of eastern Ethiopia where a man is measured by how many people he's killed. Uh, still, to a certain extent, knots on a string hanging from his belt. And the Afars are not freakish. They merely allow something to surface, which we, for very good reasons, suppress. And when we look at the developing world, we can often see things in the law which apply to us too. Never said that before, <laughs> not publicly. <laughs> not a very good thing to say, but I believe it. <laughs> I think that um, if you look at the way corporation, corporations behave, you could use a very, develop a very similar model um, for the information warfare that takes place between them, uh, the spying they do on each other, the industrial espionage, uh, the publicity campaigns, and uh, the misinformation uh, they try and put out. And um, 
The idea that we can look at warfare as a, a model of business. People are constantly putting Sun Tzu, the um, early Chinese um, writer on warfare and his maxims on warfare. And uh, some of the things he said is, try not to fight your enemy. Try and defeat him by subtlety. Information. Play with his heart and mind. Um, so it does have implications just beyond the kind of conflicts I was talking about. And I think the idea of creating a matrix of some kind or other, not necessarily my circular one, uh, in which you can uh, systematize information, uh, data, whatever you want to call it, about the use of information in some form of conflict or competition. It's got a lot of potential. Hmm, what could I ask about it? <laughs> nice to get so many questions. Sometimes you finish and people just sort of nod. <laughs> I bothered really. <laughs> Thank you for being a lovely audience.